Every time I turn around, yes, yes. the Lord is blessing me. Every time I turn around, God is blessing me. Oh, I don't deserve it, but he keeps right on blessing me. Every time I wave my hand, come on, wave your hands, people. God is blessing me. Every time I raise, wave my hand, the Lord is blessing me. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Beloved, we give thanks today for the opportunity that God has afforded to us to come together in this virtual space to worship the magnificent and majestic God who has ordered the cosmos, to give thanks to the God that has provided goodness and blessing to you even through the week that we have had and the tough days that we will have in the future. We give thanks to the God who can still make a bridge over troubled waters and who can still provide peace to us in the midst of the storms that we go through individually and collectively. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for God is good and God's mercy endures forever. Blessing me. And my soul says, Yeah. yeah. God's name. Bless God's name. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord.
Friends, we now wish to lift up a word from the Lord that comes again from the Gospel of Luke. And in the 10th chapter, verses 38 to 42 of the New Revised Standard Version, we find these words. Now, as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. My soul loves Jesus. My Family, won't you pray with me? God, we thank you for this opportunity that you offer us to worship, to learn, to receive, to hear, to feel, to take in, to make change in our life that we might 
live in a way that is in alignment with how you would wish us to live. Help us, God, in this moment. Help me, God, this preacher who has read and has studied but is now asking that you would come forth mighty and strong and deliver unto us that which you are desiring for us to receive. Help us to cast off all of our individual distractions and to have the understanding that you are speaking. Spirit of the living God, fall on us afresh that we might be forever changed. And may the word of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. We, in this text, are still dealing with Jesus on a journey into Jerusalem. Early in Luke 10, uh, the writer has shown that Jesus has commissioned, rather sent a 70-person group out to, to minister and to start the work of training people and letting them know about that which God has done or is doing in Christ Jesus. They are sent, they are going, they are ministering, they are teaching, they are preaching, they are healing, they are casting out that which is befouling those in the countryside. And Jesus is continuing to journey on. And you, you remember last week we had this interaction where Jesus is in a scene with someone who is asking Jesus a question. And Jesus turns things around and asks him a question and gives in this opportunity us the chance to see that we have to love God with all of our heart and our soul and our mind and our neighbor as ourselves. Jesus is able to uh, tell this young person, this young lawyer, how it is that they are to obtain, attain, arrive upon and within eternal life. And, and as he says and tries to justify himself looking and asking, who is the neighbor? Jesus says, uh, or rather recounts this story, this notion, this parable of the Good Samaritan and asks him at the end who the neighbor was to the person who was robbed, who was beaten, who was stripped, who was left half dead along the side of the road. And it is evident that the person who was the neighbor was the Samaritan. The Samaritan was not a person that was to be respected in Israelite culture. The Samaritan was, uh, 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 was not a worshiper in the true sense that they knew worshipers to be. They didn't recognize the same God in the same ways. They didn't have the same heritage. They didn't have similar parentage. They were mixed in ways that, that caused problems in the eyes of the Israelites. And here we see that Jesus uses a story, a parable about one who is not the same, one who is definitely the other, one who is marginalized in Israelite society. If they were to find themselves there, perhaps, and Jesus says that was the one, not the priest, not the Levite, the Samaritan was. He pushes on from that place and he makes his way to a home that is uh, owned by this woman, Martha. Martha owns a home. And Martha has her sister there. And he has journeyed to this place just like the 70 that he sent out. He is now journeying into a certain village. And he comes in and he arrives at Martha's house. And Martha welcomes Jesus. And Jesus is able to be in this space as one who preaches, teaches, talks, shares, uh, loves, cares, and allows himself to spend some time with these people. Martha is doing the things that she feels she needs to do as the host. And these are women in the ancient Near East, and there are some roles that need 
to be respected in the culture. There are some things that they are supposed to do. And Martha is busily engaged in the social things that she's supposed to do. I've got Jesus in my house. I've got to prepare some food. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. Maybe, maybe there's some cleaning she needs to do. Maybe there's some other work that she feels that she has to do. And she's doing it. Mary sits by Jesus' feet. Mary sits in the dust learning. Mary, a woman, sits in the place that the disciple might sit in. Mary, a woman, doesn't speak and ask questions as some students of Jesus have. He doesn't, she doesn't sit there and ask questions. She is not engaged in conversation the same way we have seen in other texts that the Samaritan woman has. But Mary is sitting there and we are believing or thinking that she is learning. She is preparing. She is paying attention. She is operating in this role as student. And Jesus is doing his thing, and Martha has a problem. There's conflict between the two, at least from Martha to Mary. Martha comes out and tells Jesus uh, that she has a problem. Mary is not doing the things that she needs to do to help me to properly handle our roles. And you, Jesus, need to tell her if you care. Don't you care? Don't you care? Don't you care about this situation like you cared about the disciples' well-being when they were out on the, on the water and the, the water was troubled and the storm came along? Don't you care that the, even though the stakes are different, the, the role is required and I am doing my part. I'm holding up my end of the bargain. I am doing what I need to do. Don't you care? Tell this woman to get up off of, off of Rusty Dusty and come on back into the back to help me to do the things so that we can all sit down and enjoy some time with Jesus. Jesus responds. He says, Mary's, uh, he says Martha's name twice, uh, perhaps to get her attention, perhaps as a, a way of endearment, Martha, Martha. Let me tell you a couple of things. Let me stop you right there. Let me hold you right where you are. I got to tell you something that you need to know. He tells her, you have so many distractions. You've got things that you're thinking about and you don't need to be worried about this thing and that thing and the other thing. You are here with me and there's one thing you need to focus on. He instructed that Mary has done nothing wrong. Matter of fact, that Mary has chosen the better part. And that is not going to be taken from her. You could have chosen the other parts. You could have chosen some other parts. Oh, I got to clean. Oh, I got to prepare some, some, some towels or something to refresh them. Oh, we got to get the food ready. Oh, I got to make sure that we've got the right amount of sugar in the sweet tea. Oh, we've got to make sure that everything is right. Do we have enough hot sauce for this fried chicken? I'm, I'm just supposing and putting it in terms that I would like to know. Jesus is saying, you focused on all this stuff. You got all these other parts that you could be playing. There is a better part. Mary has chosen that, and I'm not going to change this up for her, for you. We're going to move on. You are not going to get what you want. He doesn't say, I don't care. He says, you need to care about other things. You need to choose a better part. Matter of fact, you need to choose a better part like Mary has. This is an ancient story, and perhaps some of the things that we're dealing with, we don't always pick up like some of the ancients might with respect to what it is you're supposed to offer when a guest comes to your house, what it is you're supposed to do, what, uh, the importance of, of food and preparation and the, the rules that are uh, uh, around with respect to, to ingesting food, but also that which is provided in being able to welcome community to the table and to eat. Oh, certainly there is work to be done. There are things that need to happen. 
But Jesus is saying, you are not focused in on the right thing. Well, here we are in a modern world, reading another ancient text and trying to make it application to us. Uh, there's a number of things that we can say. But we still live uh, about the differences of, between us in this time and them in their time. There are a number of things that we can say about how we're different from where they were. We live in a different land. We speak a different language. We clearly live at a different time. But we still live in a world and in a society where there is a strict social order with respect to all sorts of different things. Race and class and gender still mean much in our society as, as modern as we think we are, as advanced as we think we are. We are still living in a patriarchal society. We're still living in a society that preferences heterosexuals over others. We still live in a society where white supremacy or the, the fallacy of white supremacy is real in the laws and the policies and the social arrangements of this country. We live in a world where gender is constructed in such a way as to have very, very well-defined places for men and for women. We live in a world where men can make decisions about how women can and cannot control their very bodies. How, how present that has been made to us this week, how real that has been made to us even this week. And other rights fall or have the propensity to fall under the false legal reasonings that have caused us to be in this current moment with the end, uh, the overturning of Roe versus Wade. We live in a society where a privileged few make decisions about who is expected to be subservient and who is expected to be preeminent. It is even evident in the minds of children, of, of toddlers, of little kids. It is evident in the mind that er, there is a social order and it is right for certain people to be placed in the front and others to be set in the back. We can look at the studies of who plays with what kind of dolls and what kind of dolls are worthy, are bad, are ugly, are beautiful. And we've seen this in the 60s and the 70s. We've also seen it, I've seen it in my own home when I asked my little girl one day with this cartoon, how come the little white boy is always driving the ship? How come the little girl can't drive the ship? How come the little black boy can't drive the ship? Oh, daddy, that's not their job. Their job is to sit in the back. They're not the lead. Is it because they're not expected to be the leader because we set these things up this way? Yes, there is something to be said for when I invite someone to host uh, to my house and I am their host, but sometimes we have to realize that there are distractions. There are parts that we place upon ourselves or reinforce in our own selves that have been placed there by society. And we're saying that we've got to prioritize this task. We've got to prioritize this happening. We've got to prioritize this thing above that which God is calling us to do because of who we are in the social order. And Jesus is saying that's not the case. Jesus is saying you don't have to do that. The dominant strain of our faith has been colonized to uh, reinforce evil in our society and to put down our view of Jesus as a liberator. So much so that the notion and, to, and command to love God and love people takes a back seat to accepting the unjust status quo. This is the world in which we live. There are churches where it, it is preached that the unjust status quo is the way it is because God said it and we should just accept that and only think about the life beyond the river. That is all that is to be considered. I think Jesus is saying something else to us in this conversation that he has to Martha, with Martha. He's certainly saying some things to Martha. He's certainly saying you've got to pay attention to what the better part is. But I think that there are some things that can be applied to us from what Jesus in Luke is saying to Martha. And I've got three things that I believe the believer must keep prominent in their mind with respect to Jesus in this scene. First, you've got to be present with God. 
God with us, God in Christ Jesus, has been welcomed into the home. You mean to tell me you've got this God with us in the home and you're off in the back doing this, that, and the other? You mean to tell me that it's time to have an interaction with God and you getting your swiffle wet jet out to clean the kitchen floor? You mean to tell me it's time to have an interaction with God and you're pouring the bleach cleaner into the toilets to let that soak? You mean that it is time to have an interaction with God and you are seasoning the chicken? Jesus has already told the, the 70 that he sent out, if they welcome you, come on in and spend some time with them and, and, and eat what they give you. Sit something down for Jesus to be able to help him to refresh himself, prepare him for the next part of his journey. But you need to make sure that you are present with God. Sometimes it's hard to be present with God, but that's the better part. Sometimes it's hard to be present with God and, and, and we choose to just give in to the distractions. We choose to watch television. We choose to scroll social media. We choose to go on and get started with the day. And you know, once things get rolling, you may not have the chance to come back because you are moving from one thing to the next thing to the next thing to the next thing. Choose the better part. Come and spend some time with the one you've welcomed in to the home. He has come to spend time. God in Christ Jesus is in in our midst are we going to spend time with God be present be present be present turn off the distractions that would keep us from having some personal devotion with the one who is trying to share with you trying to uh, uh, to 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 like the like the like the disciples on the Emmaus road share with you some of the things that the scriptures say. How about we be present with God and and feel the feelings of our hearts burning and and know the good th the feeling of hearing something that you can use to encourage yourself or encourage somebody else to hear which tomorrow might. Face, how do I handle this critical issue that I'm dealing with? Spend some time. Be present with God. Choose a better part. Be focused on God. Not just be present with God. Be focused on God. Luke, as the New Interpreter's commentary says, makes this connection between Jesus preaching and the word of God. And while we may not open our door and have Jesus walk and stroll into our living room, we can open up the scriptures and spend some time dealing with the things that Jesus has said. The words that Jesus has repeated, even in Luke as Jesus repeated that those, those scriptures from Isaiah, to be able to remember that there are some things that ought to be at the core of the religion that you follow, just like they were at the core of the religion of Jesus. Here we have an opportunity to focus in on God. Let us listen. Let us read. Let us take in. Let us behold. Let us hold on to through the focus we have on God and God's scriptures. Here we have the chance to figuratively put ourselves in the dust of the home and listen at God's feet through the scriptures that we might be able to be challenged like all of those under Jesus hearing, hearing the story, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Oh, we might say, see, y'all need to learn this so that you do what is right. But what's really true is that we all need that refresher course. We all need to be reminded of what our reflect, what our relationship is with our neighbors, how we should share with them, how we ought to love them, how do we deal with them when they are not unconscious stripped and bare by the side of the road, but when they're 
uh, powerful and in front of us and holding us down? How then do we love folk when we still are working to subvert the unjust social order? How do we love folk when we still are engaged in, 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 in spiritual warfare? How do we love folk when we are still trying to work for justice? And it might mean that we are loving somebody in conflict. I can say I love you, but I still have to have you get your boot off my neck and I'm not going to accept it. Jesus never said that you had to. Here we are listening to God in the scriptures. We have to be focused on God. Choose a better part. We have to be ready to resist the social order for God. Be ready to resist the social order for God. There may be times when we have to stand up and say, that's not the way I see it from my religious point of view. You might be identified with a particular political party, but that is not what's so important to God. It is not the color or the image that you might hold on your t-shirt or from flags or even, even in your own mind. It is how it is that we are choosing to live a life that is aligned with that which Jesus has already said. And sometimes that might mean some resistance. I don't know how the next few years are going to go. It might might mean that we have to do some of the things that, that they had to do in the 50s and in the 60s and in times since then, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the 20s, the, the 2000s, the 2010s, and, and now even the 2020s. It might mean some civil disobedience. It might mean some, some open conversation on the unjust social status quo. It might mean that we have to say some things to our friends and to our family members. It might might mean that we have to claim some things in the public square. It might mean that we have to make a decision about where to stand and how to stand in the face of the unjust status quo. But whatever it is, we must be ready to resist the social order for God. That may not necessarily mean protest. It might mean that you have to say, my gender role is not what's important here. It's choosing a better part. My, my social role, my class role is not what's important here. It's choosing a better part. My, my comfort is not what's important here. Oh, we love to watch our streaming. We love to binge watch. Hey, listen, I love to watch my shows. I'm a Star Wars fan and I have enjoyed Obi-Wan Kenobi but you know sometimes you got to turn the television off and say it's time to read it's time to prepare it's time to make statements it's time to meet it's time to organize it's time to study it's time to get ready it's time to be with those who are like-minded and say these things while I might need to de uh, decompress, while I might need to watch something else and let my mind wander, while I might need to enjoy the arts, while I might need to have this time to recharge my creative batteries, I cannot stay there. I've got to choose a better part, and that might mean that I've got to get up. I've got to join certain conversations. I've got to be a part of certain uh, agglomerations of people, certain aggregations, certain clubs, certain things. I've got got to start going to council meetings. I've got to listen to what's going on in the public schools. I've got to know what's happening in my community. And not only that, but I have to let my voice be known as one that follows God and one that claims Jesus Christ. I'm not saying proselytizing everybody. I'm saying stand up for the virtues, stand up for the values, stand up for the people that God has said you must care about. You may have to stand up and say this is not the way I see it and I need to add my voice be ready to resist the social order for God choose a better part choose a better part perhaps Jesus is a model 
in how he comes into this home and is not so concerned with the production of the meal, is not so concerned about all of the things that should or could happen in when someone is being received at the home, is not even enumerating, Luke isn't, that all of these things that are we are used to hearing about when one comes into someone else's home, we haven't even learned whether or not those, those boxes were checked. We don't know if they put oil on Jesus' head. Maybe they didn't have any and Mary was supposed to go get it. I don't know. But Jesus is a model in that he tells her, you got to do this thing and you got to do and choose a better part. But not only is Jesus a model, I think Luke offers a model for the believer in Jesus Christ, both in the story that is told about Jesus and in the story that Jesus tells. Taking together the parable of the Good Samaritan and that which is the scene between Jesus and Martha and Mary, perhaps we have a model for how the believer ought to take seriously that which Jesus has said in Luke 10. Perhaps we have a model. Perhaps these stories have power in and of themselves, but really have power when you look at them together, looking at the New Interpreter's commentary where it is asserted that we need both to really understand them in the light of Jesus uh, in his conversation with the lawyer saying, but you got to love God and you've got to love your neighbor. Maybe what is being said here is, yes, Mary loves God. And yes, the good Samaritan sees his neighbor. But you and I spiritually with our spiritual eyes need to be able to see our fellow human as our neighbor. And we ought to be able to hear uh, with our spiritual ears that which God is saying to us in the scriptures and in our private devotion. Maybe we need to love God and to love our neighbor in this way in order to fully follow our God, to, in order to fully follow Jesus in order to really be that which God has created us to become. We need at this point in time to see that the two greatest commandments is important for us. I, I, I can't remember, I can't remember too many sermons where I really had this at a focus when I was coming up in the church. But I know that here in 2022 on this fourth Sunday, as Roe has fallen, as Griswold might fall, as Lawrence might fall, as Loving could fall, we as a society in a place where we are hoping to live our lives fully and freely, we need to make sure that folk hear that God has called us to love. Love God and love our neighbor. And that which cannot love God and that and do what God has said do. And that which cannot love our neighbor and show that we do in our actions is not for us to be playing footsie with. We have to choose a better part. In all of our lives, we have to choose a better part. Not just when we are at our homes, but in the public square, when we're in the front seat of our car, driving down the street, walking down the avenue, living our lives in the various ways that we do, we have to choose a better part. And there is a place for you. There is a way to do it. And I invite you to continue to read this critical scripture in Luke 10 and to consider the ways that you need to operate and change in your operation and continue in your operation, whichever it might be, in order to continue to choose a better part, to love God, to appreciate God, to be present with God, to be focused on God, and to be ready to resist the social order for God. God did not create us simply to live by tradition. Some traditions needed to die back then, and they need to die now. And we have to be able to let them pass from us. Here we are, brothers. Here we are, sisters. Here we are, fellows. Here we are, 
Christians. Here we are, believers. Here we are, lovers of God. Can we choose a better part? Can we make this a better place by being present and being focused and being ready to resist the social order? Jesus has shown us that that's not important. Jesus has shown us how to let some of that stuff go. Jesus has shown us how to cast off these distractions. Jesus has shown us how to move past that which would bind us. Jesus has liberated us from the stuff that we can use to bind ourselves and to bind others. And now we get to choose a better part. The Christian life is full of choices. And there's an opportunity right now to choose Jesus. I, I, don't present, I don't present or offer Christ in a way that says only that you need this for salvation. You do. I believe that you have to accept this truth. But I'm not saying that that's all for us, especially as we live in this society. I'm not of the belief that it has to get worse each and every day. I'm of the belief that it can start to get better, or even if conditions get worse, we can respond to them in better ways. We can say, listen, I want you to, to walk this way. I want to explain some things about Jesus so that the two of us, and then the four of us, and then the 12 of us, and just like that Prell commercial from the 70s and 80s, and so on, 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 and so on can then face the problems that we have to face in this world together, bound in love, present with Jesus, focused on God and ready to disrupt the social order for the purposes of God. Can we choose a better part? Can we love God? Can we love God so hard that we seek to hear what God is saying and to seek to do what God is calling us to do in such a way as it also makes sure that we remember we got to love our neighbor. One informs the other. Here now, the doors of our church are, are always open. And we are willing to walk this way, journeying like Jesus was journeying. We want to journey with you. Whosoever will, let them come. Family, we give thanks for the opportunity that God has afforded to us to be able to worship together as a faith community, to be able to minister together as a people who are focused in on the gospel of Jesus Christ and not simply enjoying it and reserving it for ourselves, but also to pushing things out and showing the love of God in Christ Jesus that we have in ourselves through that which we are able to do. We're thankful that you have been faithful in your giving and we are hoping that you will continue to be faithful as we try to step up a little bit higher each and every day, each and every month. We've got some great plans coming up this summer. We want to do some things for the community. We need to take care of some issues here in our own house and we are asking that you would continue to be faithful that we can make sure that there's meat in God's house and that we can do ministry that we've been called to do here in Newark. We're hoping and praying that you will continue your giving throughout the summer and that if you are unable to worship with us in person or virtually this Sunday or next Sunday or some other Sunday as you take your vacations and spend time with your family and friends in different places as you go outside into the world, we hope that you will electronically communicate with us through Givelify or perhaps make sure that you could send a love gift in the mail to 587 Reverend Tony E. Jackson, Senior Way, Newark, New Jersey, 07107. That is our mailing address, Bethlehem Baptist Church. And we hope that you, if you need to, for more information about ways to give and where to give, please visit our website, Bethlehem Newark. 
www.ghostofgod.org slash donate. In the ways that you choose to give, in the amounts that God has led you to give, we will give thanks for you and for that which you provide. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and may God continue to bless you and yours. Beloved, we give thanks to God for this word, for this opportunity to gather, and we ask that God would use us the way God chooses to. Not to dictate to God to, to turn off that which we think needs to be turned off in our distractedness, but to choose the better part and have God reveal to us ways in which we should go, the ways in which we should live, the ways in which we should love, the ways in which we should serve, the ways in which we should be better to ourselves and to those around us. And until we are able to spend some time together again, one with another, we pray that you will receive this benediction. And now unto the one who is able to keep us from falling and who presents us faultless before God's glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and evermore. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Go in peace, beloved, and may the peace of God go with you. Lord, my soul desires you. Nothing else will ever do. There's no greater name. Christ, you stay the same. Lord, my soul.